all doing well, whatever it is that you're doing right now. And I hope you can spare time for me in this video. So what do we have here? I'm going to teach you how to write a sonnet, Shakespearean sonnet. Well, a sonnet is a poem, a 14-line poem, actually. It mostly talks about love, but it can still talk about nature and some relationships. This video is going to guide you how to write a sonnet. So usually, before I'm going to ask my student to write or to do a task, I have to do the task myself so that I could easily give instructions. Here it is, the sonnet or I wrote. I'm not going to show you a Shakespearean sonnet, I mean a pure Shakespearean sonnet, a sonnet that's written by Shakespeare himself. I already have shown you that in my previous video. Here, you're going to look at the, the Shakespearean sonnet that I have written. That is, of course, to simplify because Shakespeare is such a great mind that we may not easily understand it. So my mind is just smaller compared to him, so perhaps you could dwell on this one. Okay, I this is actually my second sonnet, the second sonnet that I wrote. The first one was horrible. It is entitled The Lamenting of a Muse. I wrote this one. There are four components of a Shakespeare sonnet. So it's like storytelling, but in 14 lines. So the challenge is, how can you tell me your love story? Or what do you feel about your situation right now, your relationships, in 14 lines? Okay, so um, you have your exposition, the metaphor, the twist, and the couplet. Those are the four essential components of a Shakespearean sonnet. Okay, so before we go there, Shakespearean sonnet, I already have introduced this to you in my previous video. It is iambic pentameter. What is that again? Iambic pentameter, that means it's each line is composed of 10 syllables. Yep, and five, that means it's, there are five iams, a pair of unstressed and stressed level, five pairs of iams in each line, making it 10 syllables per line. And a Shakespearean sonnet is also following an alternating rhyme scheme. Alternating rhyme scheme. That means the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Let's take a look at the, the lines in the poem closely. So you have there, it is A, B, A, B, the, the first four lines. So shores, A, eyes, course, vice. So shores rhyme with course, eyes rhyme with eyes. For C D C D, fall. Look at the last line, in, uh, the last word in each line. Fall rhymes with enthrall, moon, lagoon. For E F E F, relentlessly rhymes with endlessly. Muse rhymes with bruise. G G last. So that means. They rhyme. They have the same sound, the same ending sound. So extends, ends. It's GG. Yes, it's a bit taxing, but I call it challenging. Yes, it is challenging to write this song. Very much challenging. The exposition, that's the first component of a Shakespearean song. It's like when you tell a story, there is an exposition. Okay? So the exposition, it serves as an introduction to the sonnet. This is where you are presented with the problem. So there is a problem, or let's just say there is a certain situation in the sonnet that is to be introduced in the exposition. So in this sonnet, why must our hearts be cast on different shoals than reappear at the time I shut my eyes? You linger swiftly in my deepest pools and vanish, leaving only sweet replies. If you're going to read it over and over again, you'd understand that this is going to be a problem, that this is going to deal with a long-distance relationship, okay? So it starts with a rhetorical question, actually. Why must our hearts be cast on different shows? That's a rhetorical question. What is a rhetorical question? That is a question which does not need to be answered. So it's a technique used by writers to stir some sort of curiosity in 
among the readers. So just the first line, you'd know that there are two hearts, two hearts, two lovers on different shores. So they are in different places. Then reappeared the time I shut my eyes. You linger swiftly in my deepest schools and vanish, leaving only sweet goodbyes. So the time you spent together must be short, very short. And sometimes the lover would just see you in their dreams, in daydreams, or in moments like that. So and then they would just go on to imagine that you're there, and then when they open their eyes to reality, you're not actually there. Next is the metaphor. The metaphor here refers to symbolism. The symbolism or the comparison. The comparison of what is to another in order to give further discussion on the problem, but poetically. Of course, it is a poem. You have to be poetic. Bring out the poetic top of yours. With every crest and ebb, we rise, we fall. You crawl back to the sea, says Mr. Moon. Where light meets water, such a sight we implore. Drifts you off to an out of reach lagoon. We'll give you an idea of how the tides work. The crest, that is, when the water kiss the shore, so it would it would tell you that it's high tide. The ebb is when the water goes away from the shore, goes away from land, that's low tide. So sometimes you're okay, sometimes you're not. So circumstances like that in relationships, it's always difficult to fix it because you are not there in person. There are some things that you cannot just talk about or you could just a hug will do. But since you are far away from each other, you have to find ways to say the right words to fix what's in, what is broken. You crawl back to the sea, says Mr. Moon. Well, if there are lovers, there is always an illusion of the moon as something that guides the lovers or that gives the romantic vibe. But in this poem, moon here is like the antagonist in the story. Yes, the moon here is, um, let's just say, one aspect that uh, drags one of the lovers into temptation. Yes, it's still the light that is being talked about here, but Mr. Moon here is asking the other to crawl back to the sea. So if one is going to crawl back to the sea, you're going away from the shore, okay? And where light meets water, such a sight we crawl. So there is light far away from the shore. So the, the moon there is leading the other to another group of, let's just say, wonderful horizon that would cause the other lover not to go back to land, but stay on water, or stay where far away from the lover. So it actually gives me this, uh, some sort of feeling that moon here is like that uh, very spirit that the sirens have, the tempting voice. Once the lover has been brought to different horizon, partying, um, easy go lucky life without attachments eventually you would have time to ponder on and that's when we go to the twist so the part of the poem we call the twist or the turn this is like if you, there is a if the entire poem starts from happy the twist gives the sad part or if it's dark the twist gives the light part if the poem is negative, the, the twist gives you the positive aspect, okay? So if it is hopeless, the twist gives hope, okay? So from light to dark, dark to light, positive to negative, negative to positive, okay? That's the twist. Let's see what the twist is in this poem. But you escaped, stole Karen's boat relentlessly to see a lasting glimpse of me, your muse. Whose feet upon the sand lament so endlessly. You came with drops of hope and ease my bruise. Okay, so the first two parts, or uh, the, the first eight lines, it talks about the difficulties of the, the long distance relationship, the struggles of the relationship. But in the twist, it presents to us how the other, or one of you, or both of the lovers, were able to surpass 
the troubles that they have to surpass the, the problems that they've encountered. Charon is uh, a character in mythology, Greek mythology. He is the fairy boatman of the underworld. So are we talking about death here? Not necessarily. We're not talking about Charon here. We're talking about his boat. So, but you escaped, stole Charon's boat relentlessly. That would denote how the, the effort that the lover is uh, exerting in order to get to the other. So, if it says Karen's boat, it denotes the underworld. So there is so much struggle, so much difficulty. To see a lasting glimpse of me in your moves, woman, or, well, in, in this era, in, the, in this modern era, we, we don't just say lovers is man and woman. So we have to respect the LGBT as well. So I would not say your muse there is just a woman. The woman and those with woman's heart. Whose feet upon the sand lament so endlessly. Which means this lover is longing for the other to come back. Longing. And the other as well is doing his part doing his best to make sure that he reaches, goes back to his muse, okay? And you came with drops of hope and ease my bruise. So, are we talking about physical bruises here? No, not. The bruises we're talking about here are those pain that is caused emotionally. So those bruises that are difficult to ease out. So only the one who has inflicted it can heal it. The last part of uh, the sonnet is the couplet. The couplet, this is like the summary of the entire poem. Or it could be the part where you are going to put the punchline to leave some sort of thoughts to ponder to your audience, to your reader. Okay? Punchline it is if you can. Okay. It matters not how far the sea extends. The water always stops to where it ends. So this line, these two lines, they are called the couplet, and a couplet, they are always rhymed. So it's GG. You see that? They rhyme. It stands and ends. That no matter where you go, no matter where the circumstances might bring you to, you would always go back home. Just like the water that flows from the rivers and creeks, they all go to the sea. So wherever you go, you would always go back home. You would always go back to the one you love. So the water always stops to where it ends. It only ends when you are home. You would only stop gallivanting the world when you are home. And have found solace in the one you love. And that is The Lamenting of a Muse, written by me, of course, and at the same time, I taught you the components of the sonnet. So when you write that sonnet, don't forget the metrical P. You can learn about a yambic pentameter and how it is used in poetry. So you can just click on the description below for the link. So let me read to you the entire sonnet without cutting, um, without interruptions with my discussion. Why must our hearts be cast on different shores? Then reappear the time I shut my eyes. You linger swiftly in my deepest pools and vanish, leaving only sweet goodbyes. With every crest and ebb we rise, we fall. You crawl back to the sea, says Mr. Where light meets water, such a sight we endure. Drips you off to an out of reach lagoon, but you escaped. Stole Karen's boat relentlessly to see a lasting glimpse of me, your muse, whose feet upon the sand lament so endlessly. You came with drips of hope and ease my bruise. It matters not how far the sea extends, the water always stops to where it ends. So I hope you enjoyed the components of a sonnet. I know it's not really that something that you must enjoy, or perhaps in other circumstances, it's something that you must endure. So good luck with the sonnet, with the Shakespearean sonnet. If your teacher would ask you to write one, this is your go-to video. So I hope this is going to be really helpful. Ta-ta for